Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Daily Objective. And uh, we have something to talk about today that's going to excite a lot of people because everyone always wants to talk politics. Something I try to emphasize here, and I think that my co-host agrees, is that politics is a derivative issue. No matter how much importance lies, in, lies at stake, it really is a question of the culture that elects these politicians in the first place. And the best example that comes to mind is the Founding Fathers. These were thinkers. These were men of their time. If you consider the age of reason and the enlightenment, these were people that had a lot to say about the individual's capacity to think and to live by his own judgment. And they implemented a system that reflected that, albeit um, wanting in the department of who's included as an individual. But even in, the, in their context, they were taking a bold new step towards implementing their philosophy. And um, I try to remind the audience, and we try to remind the audience, that first comes spreading a philosophy of liberty, and then we will see politicians reflect that. But nonetheless, let's talk politics today. And for that, we're going to need a man who understands American politics in its deepest sense, because he is from the land that invented democracy, at least so we've been told. Nikos Sotirakapoulos. Hi. Hi, everyone. So, yeah, I agree with everything that Raga says, but at the end of the day, many of us are, let's say, politics geeks in terms of, you know, things that we've been interested in, our education background. So it's impossible not to talk politics. So because we recognize this, we start something which we're going to find a fancier name and the Lord Emperor behind the scenes is working hard for that. But for now, let's call it something like Election Tuesday. So maybe once every week, every Tuesday, we see what's happening with the U.S. election. And usually the saying is that this is the most important election in a generation. We've heard this. We definitely heard it in the previous election. Now, I think this time, this is in, not necessarily the case, but if there was once that this was an important election, it's this. But not because of what is at stake. It's not that, for example, you have individual rights at stake, because unfortunately, none of these two sides really understand them, and we're going to elaborate on that. But because it's the first time that you get this feeling that whatever the result will be, it, there's going to be trouble. And this is one of the topics we're going to talk about. But before that, so if I told you, Raka, how may, how, for how much money would you sit down and watch the whole of the Democratic National Convention? Name your price. You know what? I, I would probably do it for uh, $100 a day. I know that I know you were expecting some uh, hyperbolic answer, but it sounds, it sounds both boring and fascinating all at once. What about you? I'm glad you asked because I watched not the whole thing, I have to be honest. I didn't watch the whole thing. I watched some of the main speakers so i have various things to 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 comment on so so here's here's what looks to be happening so the democrats say basically their line of attack is that trump is not fit to be president and this has been sold this was actually at the center of uh, of michelle obama's uh, speak we also saw bernie sanders saying that he feels very proud that most of the staff in his agenda is slowly implemented by the Democrats, which is, by the way, also the big criticism of the other side, that they're, go, they're becoming, quote, radical left, which is something that I'm not really buying, but that's another discussion. So you listen to that and you say, yes, there is something like that. So even if you hate the Democrats, you think by voting Republicans, I'm actually sanctioning and telling thumbs up to a guy that no matter what was your view in 2016, he has clearly let you down if you are somehow a reasonable person. But at the same time, you listen to the Republicans and they say, look, if you vote the Democrats, you're sanctioning basically how they've been tolerant of what's been happening in the last months, how they are divisive and intentionally divisive. They play the identity politics card. So, and, and also the idea is if you vote for them, the whole of the United States will become California. Alex Epstein had a very nice Twitter thread about the energy situation in California and what would happen if Joe Biden actually implements 
his agenda in the whole of the country. So here's my question to you. And I know that this is the least philosophical question ever, but which of the two you think is worse? Because one of the two is going to win. And people like you are going to be living in that country. So you cannot just say, let, let it go to flames, which anyway, it's not a good way to see it. So what's your evaluation of both, let's say, of the competitors? I mean, I see Biden as sort of the candidate that the base didn't want. I mean, the base being like the radicals of that party, the, the leftists. So they, people, they wanted Bernie. And a lot of people even think that he's too uh, centrist that he's not leftist enough, he's not socialist enough. But Biden is the guy that everyone was, was, was rooting against in the vocal part of the Democrat Party, like the excitable, uh, sort of more philosophical, albeit a philosophy that I disagree with, side of the Democrats. So um, there's no enthusiasm around Biden. If he's elected, then that sends a message to the Democrats, yes, go for the center, don't listen to the base, don't listen to the excitable radicals and go safe, play it safe. So that might inspire Democrats to move in that direction. And on the Republican side, if Trump loses, that sends a message that this populist experiment is a failure, or it might send that message. Um, and I hope it would send that message. So I would like to see... It, look, the question of Biden's energy plan, I, I, I can understand saying, oh, he's going to pass it, it's going to work, and then the whole all of civilization is, is over. I, if, if that's the case, then obviously avoid uh, Biden at all costs. However, if it's, not a, if it's not certain that Biden will be able to pass his energy changes at, or that even if it passes, it will take decades and decades to implement so it can always be overturned later, if this is not a matter of life and death, I think the best thing to hope for and to root for, and I know this is going to upset some people, is to see Republicans punished for these shenanigans, for this populist embarrassment. Republicans need to do some soul searching. And I hope, I hope someday Republicans look back at this decade and at this term and say, wow, what were we thinking? So I think... Um, as hard as it is to, to admit, I think uh, Biden might be the guy to root for. What do you think? Well, I, I'll be open and say I have no answer yet. I haven't made up my, I know I wouldn't vote either of them, but uh, I'm, not, I'm not entirely convinced. I mean, here's what really, really pisses me off with the Democrats. They have reached a level of arrogance in which because they enjoy, let's say, the support of the intellectual establishment that anything goes. And I want to mention something that happened on TV the other day and caught the attention of many people, but for me, there's more that needs to be said. So Stephen Colbert was interviewing Kamala Harris. And at some point he asked the question that is on the mind of many people that you attacked Joe Biden quite fiercely in the past, both on the issue of believing his accusers or that's what came out that 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 was kind of what happened or on the issue of linking him i'm not saying that he was a racist but linking him with racist elements and what was kamala harris reaction she said it was a debate and they start they both start laughing like i couldn't watch it the second time it was so creepy and it was, I thought, okay. And then there was no discussion. Obviously the Republicans run with it, but there was not like, there was no comeback. It's like a, as if it's never happened. So notice two things happen here. First, you have a politician who is so unprincipled, who is telling you in your face, in your face, she's telling you that I'm such a power luster that I'm going to attack someone's integrity or put into question his character just to score points. Like for me, this would disqualify you from my books just like that. But then, you know, there's no comeback. Do you remember that scene in Atlas Rugged? The question is rhetorical, I'm sure you do. Dagny Taggart goes to Bertram, to what's his name of that horrible guy? Bertram Scudder. Not Russell. No, Bertram Scudder yeah. <laughs> on the radio interview. Mm. And she's basically having the whole regime 
freaked out and they cut her out on air. And she leaves the studio. And there's no word about it. And after, let's say, a month or so, uh, Jim's uh, wife, uh, the tragic figure in Atlas Rock, who's uh, Sari. So she asked him, Jim, what happened with that interview? And Jim says, well, Bird of Scudder was fired. Everything has been sorted out. The issue is over. And he says, how is this over? Is anyone going to comment on what Dagny said on air? Is it true? And Jim's like, leave me alone. The issue is over. It's, it's something like that here. It's as if it never happened. And it's very interesting to see again how the, quote, progressive establishment is dealing with these attacks of Kamala Harris to Biden. So listen to this. In one of the most prominent publications of the country, what they say is that the fact that she actually attacked him is good for both. Why? Because it shows that that question, and quote, that question is a furtherance of what makes Biden respect her so much. Hmm. So Biden then is a guy that if his integrity is attacked, he's going to respect you more. And listen to my favorite one, quote, that he still chose the same woman who critiqued him as his closest partner to rebuild America, blah, 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 speaks very highly about how Joe Biden views female leadership and the ability for someone to call him to the mat, said one of kind of uh, people who is important in politics. He will quote, get up, shake hands, and be willing to listen and learn, end of quote. And my question is to learn what? So he needs to learn that he's a bad person or a creepy person or a person that deals with racists. Like, is this the moral character? And is this the, the, is this the moral fortitude of the person who's gonna be the president of the United States? And again, they are throwing this to our face. And we're supposed to say, oh yes, you know, it's, it's, it's so nice. So these are the things that I'm seeing and I can't get my head around the stuff that, okay, I understand how horrible Trump is, but, the, but sanctioning this really makes me sick. Look, um, uh, Kamala was trying to be relatable when she's like, hey, this is politics, it's a debate, and that's supposed to be relatable, and maybe it worked on some people. Maybe, people, maybe some people said, oh, finally a real and honest person is, is running for office. But look, I mean, Kamala is unpopular. Like, Democrats voted against her in the primaries, and um, a lot of Democrats didn't like her answer either. The correct answer would have been, the PR answer would have been, listen, there was a lot of racism. There's been a lot of racism in this country, as we can see by looking around us and look, carrying on, there's a lot of racism. And a lot of us were very uncertain where the racism is. See, I should be her PR person. I, I know how the game is played. There's a lot of racism happening and it was unclear. And a, by, you know, we were hoping Biden would have done a better job in distancing himself from certain people. But from here on, I'm gonna make sure that, he, that Biden does not keep any, any friends close to him that have any of those skeletons in his closet. That's a promise I make to you, America. That would have been the PR answer. And, but beyond that, let's be fair. I mean, we are, like both parties and all, most of voters play this game where they're willing to put the past aside. I mean, primary season, every candidate in, of the same party treats one another like they are the enemy. You know, everyone rightfully, um, maybe not for all the right reasons, but everyone luck uh, rightfully was opposed to Trump becoming the Republican nominee. Probably there's, uh, probably maybe Bernie sort of is, was that on the left or people like, like him that like are like too socialist for their, for their liking. And I think Bernie was that in the, in the, nominate in the uh primary debates right everyone's like oh you crazy socialists we're not going to win this way now suppose bernie was the nominee now you'd have biden and all these people lending giving their support to him and you'd have colbert it's pronounced colbert by the way i think oh, his, sorry, Chris, yeah. his christian name is stephen colbert but his stage name is colbert um he uh he would be asking biden hey what happened uh bernie being too crazy and radical to win biden would say hey it was a debate you know <laughs> so 
we, we, we see this everywhere. I mean, look again, look at all the people who, who basically accuse Trump of the same thing, right? Of being too cozy with the racist right. And where, where did that go? What, what, how, how does Ben Shapiro have anything positive to say about Trump um, after the way that Shapiro resisted uh, the nomination of Trump? Um, so, you know, I, I'm all for pointing at, the, at a spectacle like, hey, like Kamala on Colbert saying, hey, it's a debate, and them laughing and saying, this is so creepy. It is creepy, but sadly, it's the norm, and we see it everywhere. And, and I'll just say there's a better PR answer she could have given. Yeah, well, even in Atlas Shrugged after the show, at least, you know, Bertram's cover was hacked. Here, it was like nothing happened. But anyway, here's, here's something fun when you consider politics. So in Greece in the 19th century, there was like a tradition in elections. So there were some people who were like the equivalent of mafia, but with more like a better reputation. So what they do is when you would move, when you would move the, the, the how is it called, the, the boxes where you, with the poles, they would stab you and say, excuse me, putting a gun in your head, can we see what's happening here? They open the box, they take out the votes that were not of their guy. Back then you didn't vote with paper, you voted with uh, like uh, something like rocks. And then they say, thank you, now you can take it, you can go back. And I remember when I was taught this in history around 2000, 2001, I said, oh my God, like that's so primitive, like <laughs> that's ridiculous. Turns out then the other big issue in elections is mailboxes and mail votes because the Democrats started a theory that says that Trump is, <laughs> is taking away the mailboxes from the country, probably to stop people from voting or whatever. And if you say, what? There's a better theory that comes from the Republicans, which says that there's a good chance that the Democrats are going to interfere with uh, postal voting or mail voting or how it's called, because they control the unions, true. The unions are basically pressure groups that are going to do anything to impose their agenda. Possibly also true, up to a point, or who well. But there is an element of truth. We've seen this in the past in various places. So basically, we have the battle of the mailbox. So basically, what we have is in the 21st century in the United States, you have both parties being convinced that this election is not going to be fair. Now. This is not business as usual. I don't remember any election in, in like modern history in a Western country where I remember the such cases in Venezuela. I, I, I remember, for example, I think it was Jimmy Carter, one president who went there, you know, as he said, yeah, these elections are okay. Or I remember people going in countries that are not very famous about their records on individual rights or of democracy or however you want to call it. But it's the first time that I see both sides basically saying we don't trust the system anymore, so to speak. So what's your, what's your take on the mailbox gate? I mean, this is an excellent opportunity to set an example to the audience and say, I don't actually know the facts on the ground, just like I don't know which police are doing what out there. I can't just tell you, I feel like police are abusing people, or I feel like people are you know, throwing ballots in the trash unless they agree with the vote. I mean, I literally don't know. All I can say is we do have a semblance of checks and balances. There, it, there does seem to be integrity in, this, in the election system. And a, a big part of that is probably that both parties really care about not having their votes thrown out. So there is a balance of, of uh, pressure being applied to make sure that everyone is paying attention to that. That's all I can really say. And uh, we do see anti-establishment candidates like Trump and uh, Reagan at one point was sort of the anti, you know, the, he, he actually, you know, we, we remember him sometimes fondly for his speaking about capitalism and in individual rights at, compared to today. He was, you know, he was a, a, a founding father the way he spoke compared to today. But also don't forget, Reagan spoke about the silent majority. You know, he, I think he popularized that term. Reagan was the sort of the Trump of his time in that certain respect. He was sort of waking up the slumbering masses and saying, hey, look how radical things have gotten. You know, let's get back to the everyman. Let's get back to the uh, to middle America, you know, the, the, the forgotten man. In a certain sense, uh, although again, compared to today's Republicans, he was a, he was a fountainhead of capitalist philosophy. Um, 
What was I talking about? Yeah, we do see anti-establishment candidates get through. So it's not like there, there does seem to be some validity to the electoral process. It's not that just some puppet masters somewhere are just uh, picking and choosing the way some people would want you to believe or else Trump would not have won. Nobody from pollsters to news pundits to, um, to anyone was expecting Trump to not only win, but for it to be um, evident by like halfway through the day that he was winning. So um, again, I don't, like I said at the beginning of this spiel, I don't entirely know what's, what's literally physically taking place out there, but I have reason to think there is validity to the electoral process. I have no opinion at this time about mail-in ballots, but if it's good enough for the people who actually care about, like who actually are involved in the election, it's good enough for me. Well, I think it's very important what you say that we can't have, I can't have an opinion from the Northern of, the, of England, but I'll say one thing. I think the idea that you can rig the elections in the time of social media, of smartphones, of all that stuff, I'm not buying it. I mean, nothing is surprising me in this world. Nothing anymore is surprising me. But I, I, I would say to people, relax. Probably if you lose, it's because your program sucks. And not only your program, but also your whole view of the world and your record and all that stuff. But I- And also- Yes. Sorry, I mean, what if Mickey Mouse is, he rigs the election and becomes president? I mean, then what? The question is, what direction are we moving? What do we believe culturally? What, what values are being advocated for? And that gives us an indication of where we're heading in the future. You know, everyone acts like this, this election is it. For once, I don't know if this election is actually it. Um, and for once, I'm actually hoping the, quote, capitalist friendly party loses because uh, they need to do some soul searching and I'm tired of their antics. True. However, the Democrats didn't do much of soul searching. They no. doubled down on identity policies after 2016, but- Yeah, but they nominated, they nominated uh, a sleeping old white man to be their president. So, you know- That's, you gotta, that's yeah, they- You might, need, I, to if we say you might need to reward them for electing a guy that they, that they don't, uh, are uninspired by. If we say everything today, there's nothing left for next election Tuesday. Right. Although yeah. I'm sure uh, life is going to give us plenty of stuff to talk about. Anyway, many, many thanks to all our, to our listeners, to the viewers. Support the show. Share it if you like it. And from me and from Raga, thank you very, very much. Bye-bye.